welcome all of you, a warm welcome to everyone. On the fourth day of the International Eucharistic Congress at Hungexform, my name is Kota Stov. I'm going to be the moderator of today's program. We are going to hear four programs that seemingly are very different in this particular time slot. However, all of them point to the same direction. Today's presenter has built a stellar career as a chemical engineer. He traveled the world at the age of 30, however. He realized that he didn't want to fight for material objectives anymore. Many may know Justo Lofredo, Father Justo Lofredo, who's one of the founders of the missionaries of the most sacred Eucharist. Until the age of 30, even though he had been baptized, he didn't practice his religion. He moved to Italy, and while looking at the Shroud of Turin, he was invited to travel to Medjugorje, and this transformed his life completely. He chose to serve as a priest. After having been ordained as a priest, almost immediately was invited to participate in perpetual adoration. Thanks to the mission of the Eucharist, Approximately 3,000 perpetual adoration chapels are operating around the world. He's already been to Hungary. In his homily that he presented in St. Kelly's Church, he said that perpetual adoration is a gift from God to modern age. God transforms us into better people without any noise and fuss. Please give a round of applause to him. Today is a special day. <laughs> it's the Nativity of Our Lady. So let's start with an Ave Maria. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, benedictus frutus ventris tu, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Filis, Spiritus Sanctis. Amen. Okay. Well, first of all, an overview, short overview. For a long time, we had witnessed the secularization of societies, and this phenomenon increases year after year until he reached now, you know, total indifference, apostasy. But the worst is, oh, what? we are worried about is about our church. Because of the lack of faith that uh, we see the trivialization of worship, especially the Eucharist, very few, very few are the ones who believe in the true and real presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. Many Catholics don't, don't believe that. In the last year and a half, or less, almost two years, since the appearance of, of COVID, the, the, let's say, the pandemic, the situation has further worsened due to the lockdown and the consequent restriction of access to the sacraments. And we saw so many churches were closed. And after the lockdown, we are seeing a big drop in mass attendance. This is what I've seen everywhere. You know, people before the lockdown, I don't know, let's say 100 after the lockdown, 80% of before the attendance of mass. So it's urgent. Uh, well, the, the main thing is what to do. <laughs> what to do under these circumstances. Uh, we saw mass on, 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 on a stream. We saw, you know, a web camera focusing the exposed blessed sacrament because we have to take emergency uh, measures. But this is not a long time margin. I mean, how to make sure that remaining faith does not end up being lost this way? Where and how to apply the correct therapy to reverse the situation? The answer, the answer cannot be other than to turn to the Lord. Uh, we could say, yeah, we, we know that, yeah, but how to do it? I mean, to turn, to turn to the Lord everywhere, that is out of question. How? 
So it's urgent to reverse the process, and this was seen to be possible, and this is our experience. Whenever and wherever a chapel of perpetual adoration was established. So, what is perpetual adoration? We call perpetual Eucharist adoration to the uninterrupted adoration of the most blessed sacrament, exposed in a monstrance day and night, all year long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every, and all, that, all year long. So, this adoration has been known and practiced since many, many centuries, but inside religious congregations. However, since, let's say, the late 60s, there is a new reality, namely these chapels of perpetual Eucharist adoration, carried out primarily by lay persons, lay people. And this is the perpetual adoration we're talking about, the one I want to talk about. So, this perpetual adoration is a concrete way to place Jesus at the center of the life of the church and the, and the center of a personal and family life. If we do not go back to the Lord, things will be worse. We know, even worse. Because nobody, nobody, but the Lord can stop the downfall, you know, this trend. Only Him, just Him. For that reason, perpetual reason means a revival, revival of faith. I can tell you, and I know that many of you probably share this, 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 this the same impression. Right after the lockdown, uh, I saw, I have seen terrified people entering into the, the, the temple and the church. It seems that, you know, that was in facious area. Oh, this is dangerous. Oh, you know, I saw it. It was ter terrible. And then after that, outside, chattering, or outside in a bar. Hmm? So, the, 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 the message was that the temple, the church is a, was a highly insecure place. And the Eucharist as a potential transmission carrier. <laughs> it, it, in that, that way, there is no faith, possible faith. I mean, those, as I said, those same people then, yeah, they were talking, but inside. So, needless to say that if we are not capable of conveying faith in the Eucharist, on the real living, true presence of the Lord, in the Blessed sacram Sacrament to the faithful, any other effort to change the situation will be worthless. That's why Eucharist adoration must be established in each single parish. I'm not talking about perpetual. I'm saying Eucharist adoration. Every parish has to have e Eucharist adoration. And, you know, Adoration is a vital need to the survival of faith. Not only survival, but reinforcement, too. Pope Benedict said, adoration is not a luxury, but a priority. We could say also, not only a priority, but a need. We need to have adoration. Because adoration is, is the center, is, 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 is the first commandment, when we comply with the first commandment, every time we adore the Lord. So, whatever be possible, whatever be possible, and the measure of the possible is given by our faith, because I have seen that the Lord made impossible possible. The impossible become true reality. I, we have so many examples that was, you know, humanly talking, no, was impossible. A very small parish, a very small town. I remember yeah, here is probably one priest from Romania. And in Romania, we had a perpetual adoration in, in, in a place that, you know, the Catholics are minority. 
And now, September 15, one week from now, we are going to have the 15th anniversary of perpetual adoration in a place where Catholics are minority and that since then are adoring Greek Catholics, Roman Catholics, and Orthodox. And who made that? The Lord. The Lord. But we have to start with some faith that he can do it. It's not impossible. The first objections come always from, from us, from priests. You say, oh no, but people, you know, people. I heard something like that. People are not monks. Or, no, people, you know, during the night, nobody. In, in reality, many places, what could, we could cover first was the night hours. So, <laughs> because th there is a grace, and the Lord is calling now to have perpetual adoration. So, as I said, the, the, it's possible, it's possible to have a perpetual adoration, but at least to start with adoration. The only possibility to reverse, and I repeat, the current situation is through a strong faith revival. And in this regard, perpetual adoration is the most suitable means. We have the evidence that when the Lord is adored without any interruption, day and night, the renewal of the church place, takes place, and not only dioceses, not only, but families, individual, personal lives, and are be deeply transformed. Because they always, when we place, when we have perpetual relations, there are always a prior and an after. There's a change. Because he does that. He's the Lord. And this is a Norgian call for a Eucharist revival. It's necessary to increase the number of parishes which they are pastoral life be rooted in and nurtured by the Eucharist, celebrated and adored on a continuous basis. And one major, major uh, reason for that is that we are in the middle of a spiritual war. That's no question. We are in the middle of a spiritual war. The mystery of iniquity is at the top now. And we, our weapons, what are? Prayer, adoration. So, and besides that, we have to deal with the lack of respect, lack of reverence towards the Eucharist. And it's imperative to return to the former splendor. If previously to the COVID, Eucharist had been trivialized the situation became worse afterwards. And the reason is that uh, due to the fact that, you know, there were safety measures unwillingly, I, I know it was unwillingly, but the, the, the fact is provoked the removal of any remaining sign of reverence, of respect and adoration to the Lord. And that caused real mass and blessed sacrament adoration replacement by, you know, what substitutes a stream on, uh, on a streaming uh, masses and, 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 and uh, you know, with a camera uh, focus on, 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 a, on a monstrance uh, and this on the screen. No, this is not, I mean, this is, that could go for a time, but uh, an emergency time. But many people are staying now. Oh, no, it's very comfortable. No, I don't go to, to church because I can see the, the mass at home, you know. It's a terrible situation. We have to reverse on that situation. So, uh, let's remember Let's remember what uh, the Holy Father, John Paul II, said. He already warned us about that danger that we are living now. He said, there are, this is Ecclesia, Ecclesia de Eucharistia. There are, in fact, places 
where we note an almost complete abandonment of the cult of Eucharist adoration. To this can be added, in this or that ecclesial context, abuses which contribute to obscure right faith and Catholic doctrine concerning this admirable sacrament. Sometimes a very reductive understanding of the Eucharist mystery emerges. Deprived of its sacrificial value, it is experienced as if it did not go beyond the meaning and value of a convivial and fraternal meeting. This is Ecclesia de Eucharistia. So, for that reason, it's extremely important to call the faithful attention to the real presence of Jesus Christ in the most holy sacrament. And it's a bit, bit vital need to adore God. You know, everybody who is adoring is a testimony to others, especially when the adoration is in silence. I remember now a case in, in Spain many, many years ago, for 15 years ago or something like that, that a, a medical doctor who was agnostic for atheist, he was, you know, shocked. I mean, he was at least curious because he said, what happened in that chapel? I, I know that people go there day and night. They give nothing. It's in silence. What happened? Something should happen because people don't go to a place and, and nothing happens. Silence. And he went there. And since then, he said to the archbishop, uh, to the Cardinal Amigo, who was the archbishop of Sevilla, that he said, since then, I get up half an hour before to go to the chapel before, before going to the hospital, you know. This is the, the, the thing. We are being, you know, testimony, giving testimony of the real presence. So, <laughs> we need to, to adore God in the Eucharist. We need to remind the, the people that the Lord Jesus Christ deserves adoration because he is God. And Eucharist adoration, uh, because he, the Eucharist is he, the divine person of Christ, the eternal word, who became man in the middle of us. Hidden, yes, hidden. He's hidden. His glorious presence beneath the Eucharist veils, hidden to the eyes, to the senses, but to be discovered by faith. So, uh, let, me, let me mention also the credo, credo of um, the Pope Paul VI, credo of the people of God. It says, it's our very sweet duty to honor and adore in the blessed host which our eyes see, the incarnate word whom they cannot see, and who, without leaving heaven, is made present before us. <clears throat> Let's notice that it's a duty, and that duty is, as the poet put it, sweet, uh, both things. Not bitter, nor hard, not arduous, but sweet. It's a duty because it implies the commandment is written, the Lord your God shall you adore, and him alone shall you serve. At the same time, the duty to comply with the commandment is sweet. And this has been written in Mysterium Fide, also an encyclical of Paul VI. Anyone who has a special devotion to the sacred Eucharist and who tries to repay Christ's infinite love for us with an eager and unselfish love of his own, will experience and fully understand and this will bring great delight and benefit to his soul, just how precious is a life hidden with Christ in God, and just how worthwhile it is to carry on a conversation with Christ, for there is nothing more consoling here on earth, nothing more efficacious for progress along the path of holiness. 
You know, that's a, 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 a very important point. Not only what we receive consolation, but there is a special growth. There is a transformation. Every time I go to my holy hour, I'm being transformed. Although I, I, I don't no, notice nothing, but I'm being transformed. The Lord works. It seems that there's no action, you know. You, you go to a chapel of a preservation, no action, it seems. It appears, but it's not true. It's a more active time you have, because who is acting is him on you. He's transforming your life every minute. So even, even sometimes you're adoring, the Blessed Sacrament could turn in certain occasions painful. You are dry. Yeah, that could happen. If apparently no fruit be perceived, apparently, the Lord is worthy to be adored for himself because he's God. We should see adoration as an act of justice and also of reparation and atonement for all the, the, the sacrileges committed every day, every minute, against him, against the Blessed Sacrament, against God. Let's remember Jesus' words. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. This is uh, John 6, 56. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Therefore, remaining in Jesus before the blessed sacrament, before his presence in the Eucharist, in adoration, is the best way to have a fruitful life. And we have. We have to have a, a, a fruitful life. We have plenty of testimonies about the graces coming from perpetual adoration. The main grace everywhere, this is synonymous, the main grace is peace. People who are far from God, who, who you know, and they enter into a chapel of perpetual adoration, the testimony, unanimous testimony is always the same. I found here an unknown peace because he's a Pascal priest. He's a recent Christ peace. You know, the Last Supper, he said, Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the word gives do, I give to you. And when he was risen, that same day, that same Sunday, on the evening of that first day of the week, when he, the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst, their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. In short, the peace which we find in a chapel of perpetual adoration comes from Jesus Christ's glorious bones, flow from his sacrifice on the cross and is made present in the Eucharist that is being adored. This is the peace. And for that reason also, a chapel of perpetual adoration is oasis of peace. And not only that, it's a center of irradiation. It's, it's, you know, and, 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 and that peace touch everybody. Everybody, not only the people who are there. And all the graces goes beyond you know, the chapel. And so many people are being called, and they don't know. They enter, but they don't know why. We know cases of people who were going to commit suicide. I, I remember something like nine cases. And they end up in the chapel because the Lord called them. And that, and that was possible, that encounter, because it always was during the night hours, because it was a chapel of perpetual adoration and the doors were open. 
So I remember a case of a woman in, in, in Italy uh, that was a chapel of uh, Plato, left a note in the chapel his, saying, I have not set foot in a Catholic church for more than 10 years. If I did it before, it was only for a visit of art and nothing else, no, no faith. Now I'm here, and I don't even know why I'm here, I came in. But I believe in the peace that is here, and I want to find it. And we know that there was a woman because signed Maria Gracia. You see? This is uh, one case, but there are so many cases. People say, I don't know, why, well, what, what is this? No. Um, also, there is another case, very recent, in Argentina. Uh, a woman, her name is Maria, is from Tucumán, northern Argentina, and it's exemplary, this case. This is a humble woman, she has several children, and her two oldest children, when they went to work, the children, these sons, early in the morning, were attacked and shot by a thief. Because to take the, the bicycles. Hmm? Both were ser seriously wounded and hospitalized and had to undergo surgery. And that surgery, that was not free, they had to pay. And she had to sell the house. She was very poor. In order to, to, to pay the, the surgery. And the whole thing ends up that both young men died after the operation. Maria remained desperate, homeless, but especially without two dead sons. And she volunteers as a housekeeper. And her grief was so great, so great, that on the first day of work, she hides to cry. And the lady of the house sees her and finds out about her tragedy from Maria. And what that lady did to console that woman said, okay, come with me. And she took her to, took her to a chapel of perpetual adoration. And then came a miracle, really a miracle. Mary, Maria does not know what's happening. They say, I don't know what happened. But she feels enormous happiness, joy, tremendous joy. And she falls madly in love with Jesus. He says also, my beloved. And the story is long because there are many things, but it's enough to know that she is now an apostle of perpetual adoration, an apostle missionary of charity not from Mother Teresa, but she's, in, 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 in her apostolate, she's helping, she's being helped by the thief, by that man who killed, not directly, but indirectly, her son. He's with him because she had the grace to forgive that man. <laughs> it all came from one minute in, in, in that chapel of perpetual oration. And that man, the thief, you know, he took drugs before, and, and, and she forgave him. And she, that woman, feeds the poor. He, she goes to the most poor people to, to cook for them. And whoever she gets in touch, she doesn't all, only feed up, she takes the, that, those people to the chapel of perpetual oration. You know? <laughs> so that the people know, can see the Lord, what the Lord did in, in, in her life, but also what can do to others. You know, charity and adoration, both together. Huh? It, it, this is also, you know, that remembers me, what Mother Teresa used to say. We, missionaries of charity, Spain or pass our holy hour with the Lord present in the blessed sacrament first and after we go to find Christ in the poor. You see, both things together. So whoever 
find peace, that is the first thing, but there are so many graces, but these, these peace that are known to the world, at the end becomes a beer of peace and a peacemaker. A chapel of perpetual adoration is a center of irradiation of peace and many other graces as well. Because the Lord pours grace upon grace from the Blessed Sacrament when people stay with Him. And graces such as joy, you see that woman, tremendous, you know, grief. Two sons dead, everything, you know, terrible. And she, she found joy. Light. We are in dark times. We need light. We need the light of discernment. We need the, the, the light of truth. Healing. Any kind of healings. Spiritual healings and even physical healings. We have got now a testimony very recently in, in Poland. Rashibus. Southern Poland, that there were two women that were night adorers praying for a small uh, child, well, just born, but premature born child, and was, you know, the, the doctor said, will die, will die. There's no hope. And they prayed. And the baby is called Barbara. It's okay now. And the doctor said, this is a miracle. This is a miracle. Well, it's impossible. What's happening now is impossible. And she's okay. <laughs> so healings, any kind of healing, spiritual healing, conversion, forgiveness. Huh? The, 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 that grace of to forgive to, to somebody that hurt you. And above all, love, much love. And many vocations to religious life and to family life were born within the, the, the chapel. Many vocations. There are, on that, there are many testimonies from bishops, especially from the from United States. All the, the vocations they have because of perpetual adoration. So no action may be fruitful nor effective if it doesn't depart from Jesus Christ. For without me, you can do nothing. That said the Lord. And what I said before, from Mother Teresa. So, let's re remember also one of the documents, Deus Caritas Est Encyclical. He said, I would like to recall the priority of prayer over action. I, I, I said that because we are you know, we have to make things, make things, make things. Yes, we have to make charity and all that is the mission of the church. But first we have to go to the Lord. And the document says, I would like to recall the priority of prayer over action, since it is on prayer that the effectiveness of action depends. The church mission largely depends on each person's personal relationship with the Lord Jesus and must, therefore, be nourished by prayer. It is time to reaffirm the importance of prayer in the face of the activism and the growing secularism. Deus Caritas is number 37. So, the Lord calls everybody to come and stay with Him. And the ones who respond to His call become the Disciples first and apostles then. By means of perpetual oration, people grow, as I said before, spiritually in their personal relations, relationship with Jesus and contribute to evangelize the world. Not only that, the, the whole thing that doesn't finish in me. <laughs> the Lord touched me, touched my life, but it's not for selfishness, it's for the others. It's for my holiness, sanctity. So that is so church mission to bring Christ to the world, world and the world to Christ. This is the mission. No? And that's exactly the purpose of the new evangelization. 
Many times change, many conversions happen, for I'm making everything now new. This, uh, perpetual adoration means a, a life renewal, a parish renewal, parish life renewal, personal life renewal, conversions, healing, spiritual and even physical healing, vocations, protection, light, in times, as I said, of darkness, all come out of perpetual adoration. And adorers, besides that, the adorers during their hour of adoration make reparations and atonement for all the sacrileges, outrages, and indifferences committed against the Blessed Sacrament. Hmm? Remember, Fatima, what the angel taught to, to, to the children, reparation in front of the Blessed Sacrament, intercession also for the poor uh, sinners, Uh, let, 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 let's remind something, at least my experience, about perpetual adoration during lockdown period. Because it's not, I, I hope not, but I think this is not something that has ended. Maybe possible that we, are, we will go again through lockdowns. So for that reason I wanted to mention this experience. Most of it, not all, perpetual duration of the chapels had to go through all kinds of restrictions. From very reduced amount of people allowed in the chapel to curfews, curfew during the whole night, yeah? close. In front, in front of these facts, there are, and there were, and there are always three possibilities. First, simply accept Hmm, okay, I have to, to close, I close. Eh? I, I accept resigning completely to the situation. Second, try to find a way out. Hmm? Okay, let's, let's talk about uh, some kind of compromise with authorities, civil authorities, ecclesial authorities. Why, you know, but we could, you know, do something. And the third is resist, resist at any cost resist at any cost. And this is what I like. <laughs> In the sense of fighting to keep the chapel from closing. This resisting happened in many places with successful results. So, in order to cope with curfews during the night, Adorer teams were formed, two or three persons per night, to cover the whole night. And they went to the chapel, you know, before the, the, the curfew, let's say at 10. The, the curfew was from 10 to 6, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. They went there and they stayed there the whole night, two, three persons, to cover the whole night. Sometimes it was one person. Eh? And, and that allowed not to close perpetual adoration. They call in sometimes heroic night teams. So, now let's talk about the mission. Oh, yeah, the mission. Now we can put, you will see a slide. The mission and coordination. That, so, if you, we, you, we want or you want to establish or to restart perpetual adoration and then to ensure continuity, maintenance, uh, maintenance uh, over time, we need a mission. And that mission has two columns, two pi pillars, two columns. One column is preaching. Preaching to sensibilize, to awaken to the truth of the real presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. Just to take people who sign up as adorers. Hmm? Well, we, uh, to have a perpetual adoration, we ask for one hour a week, at least one hour a, a week. Hmm? Weekly hour. And also, uh, 
The other column is the coordination, it's a structure. But this is totally functional. I mean, is a, a service to the law, of course, first, and to the others. And what is the, the objective? The goal is that the law never lives alone. Uh, the hour will be always covered. This is the main objective for this organization. Mm. The other objective, in parallel, is to uh, help people, you know, to, to become better adorers, more responsible, to form them, let's say. Mm. So, the, the preaching is based on uh, sacred scripture and magisterium of the church, especially during any time you, you start from the, the, the gospel of the day in general. I do that. And then go to adoration. Uh, and thus is being done through homilies and on the Sunday masses, let's say Sunday of festive masses, Saturday night, Saturday evening, Sunday masses, some special days like today, for instance. And it's aimed at highlighting the fundamental truth of our faith regarding this living, real, substantial presence of our Lord in the, in the Blessed Sacrament. And also reminded that the Eucharist has been given to us to be celebrated and to be adored. And celebrations implies always adoration. Real celebration implies adoration. There is no, should not be a celebration of mass if there is no adoration, because the Lord is, is being present there. We cannot really make communion, for instance, without adoring the Lord first. So, and also Sacramentum Caritatis, for instance, said, the act of adoration outside of mass prolongs and intensifies all that takes place during the liturgical celebration itself. But also prepare, not all prolongs, also prepare. I, 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 if I'm uh, adoring, I'm preparing my, my soul, my heart for the celebration. So at the same time, people are invited, uh, you know, the, I'm talking about the, the preaching, the homily in the, in, in the Sunday Mass, and are invited to sign up for one hour uh, a week. And to be part, those who want to give a, a, a further a, a step, to be part of coordination team, to this structure. So, uh, then we have meetings <clears throat> uh, with the future adorers and to explain more because in 10 minutes, 15 minutes of homily you can say something but not much. And then we have, let's say, next Sunday, and then the next Monday, a meeting with the people who are interested, the ones who sign up, somebody that who wants to know something, probably before signing up, and the others that could be potential coordinators. We explain what is the, the task. Okay, and, uh, and so, let me see. We are going to have to see here. Okay, you, you see, um, the names could change. Sometimes you call general coordinator, or shift coordinator, different names. Uh, our supervisor, our, but the main thing is to know that we need, it, it, ideally, 29 persons. We can do with less, but we would need, ideally, 29 persons. One uh, general coordinator, who is the interface with uh, the, the, the structure, these coordinators, and the, the pastor. Uh, there is a pastor, first of all, the, the responsible, ecclesia responsible. And, um, and the other coordinators. And then is, he has the whole project, let's say. And then there are four shift coordinators. Shift, I mean, one coordinator for night hours, then we'll see. Uh, yes, here. From midnight to, to 6 a.m., then 
uh, is here, they said, AM, okay. She, uh, then morning coordinator, every six hours we have a coordinator, four. And then we have 24 uh, hourly leaders, let's say, or hourly or hour supervisors for each hour. There is one in total. So the general coordinator oversees the adoration uh, and is responsible for uh, the program to the pastor um, to ensure all aspects are correctly observed. Works also, there is also, we'll see next, you see database manager. Um, could be some coordinator or somebody else. So, uh, and then we have, there is a job description. I'm not going to go to, to the total job description because it will take time and time is, is going up. So it's ending. But uh, the, every, every, uh, each uh, adorer has a reference. And that reference is his hourly leader or supervisor. Mm? This is the one who takes care immediately. And this is very uh, important in case of absence, where there is a, a way to cover, no? In case of accent, absence, replacement, no? What we ask, this is practical thing, but I think it is, could be interesting. The, the adorer has to check first if there is another adorer at the time, at the same time. If there are none, they uh, have to search a, a replacement. And if he or she finds nothing, so goes to the hourly uh, leader or supervisor. And, uh, and then is the moment that has to find some voluntary, sometimes we have, we call the golden list, people who say, okay, I'm available to cover different, now they may sue WhatsApp, no? this is very practical. So, but this is the, the main thing to, to, to keep in mind that we have a solid basis to make that the Lord be, will be uh, on a continuous basis adored with no interruption whatsoever, okay? So now we have uh, some time left. I made it on purpose. If, if you have uh, any questions and I can answer, I will be glad to do it. Well, no, no question. <laughs> the, the main thing I want to emphasize is this, I think it was clear, but I don't know, is that uh, there is no alternative to adoration, no. To adoration in general, no. We are the church of, of Christ, the church of God, and the church adores the Lord. There is not uh, an optional that sometimes, you know, there are people who adore, no, no. All Christians adore the Christ because he is God. And all Catholics must adore the Eucharist because the Eucharist is, is Jesus Christ among us. And he wanted to stay with us uh, that way until the end of times, uh, and we can stay with him. Not individually, but as a community, a brotherhood, a fraternity of adorers. So, and we see everywhere where there is um, perpetual adoration, any parish, any place, any town, uh, there is a transformation. So the best thing to do, my advice, is to get in touch with some parish you know and ask <laughs> what's their life if they have perpetual adoration what happened before and after, okay? Well, it seems that there is no question, really? No question? Nothing? Yes. What? Normally, as I talk to the priests, they are scared, afraid, critical, and uh, how it will be and so on, the beginning. What's your experience? Maybe you uh, have the same feeling that it is not possible to find so much people uh, in order to 
manage all, all, all that because that's a miracle to find the community to do this. Yeah, he's saying that sometimes the Egyptian, I think, is that there are no uh, many people to adore. The main w one thing we could make is to see if there is a critical mass. Because it's a small parish, uh, it's, it's difficult. So in that case, if we see that, let's say, in, in, the, in the Sunday masses, this is the calculation. Let's say that go in the Sunday masses 1,000 persons, uh, one fa faithful during the, the, all the masses, all day long. There are four masses, one mass, this is an example, no? One mass Sunday evening and three masses uh, uh, during the Sunday, total 1,000. We could make a calculation between 10, 15 percent sign up. So we could have 100, 150 persons. Are not enough, because we have to cover 168 hours. But that doesn't mean that we, ha we have 168 persons are going to be covered, no. Because the distribution is not almost heinous. You are going to have a lot of people for even evening hours, let's say after seven, eight, or nine, but nobody or one or two in, during the night hours. You need something like 250, 300 people. I'm talking general, no? We have with 200 or even, but anyhow. So you know in advance that it's not enough the, 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 the parish. You have to go to other parishes. Or you have to go, uh, you know, <laughs> knocking door by door. And we did that. We did that in Spain. You know, the first chapel of perpetual adoration we had in Spain was in a very small parish, probably the smallest in the whole uh, Mediterranean. Huh? See? So, and they say, well, it's impossible. How the, well, the only way to do it was to go door by door. People who never step a foot in, 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 in the church. Never. And all of a sudden say, seeing, you know, not two testimonies of Jehovah or two, you know, two Mormons, two priests. <laughs> What's going on? And, and, and that was a very nice experience because, you know, they, they opened uh, their houses, their hearts, everything. And they became not only more, many of them adorers, but, uh, you know, parishioners. <laughs> they were out, totally out. The church went to find them, right? to the periphery, <laughs> but to bring those people to the center, to God. So, and uh, even uh, we did that with no need in Mexico. In Mexico, we had already 700-something adorers, oh, a lot. But even though we went, uh, and we, 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 we take many people, many other people. Uh, that's a possibility. Or going to other uh, churches in the, you know, surrounding churches to preach also and to get adorers. This is the way. Okay. Now, it's okay. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> mm.